everyone. It's Heath from the Meet Your Species podcast, and I'm here to talk to you about uh, what you're about to experience because, well, I'm here in the future in 2020, and this podcast was recorded long ago, many moons, many years, and so um, I was not nearly as competent as I am currently at making films or recording these podcasts. <laughs> so, having said that, I just want to tell you, um, I want to want you to brace yourself because uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, the video is not great, and um, my my ability to frame a shot was quite awful, <laughs> and so <laughs> this is just kind of the reality. And also, um, I, I film a lot of these podcasts at people's homes because, uh, especially in that time, pre-COVID times. Um, when I would go to people's homes, it was just a great way to get people more comfortable and also so that if you're watching a video, you can actually see and feel what it's like being this person at their house, which gives a lot more context and is nice. Having said that, at uh, our, our guest today was uh, Barry Brandon, who I met at um, a singing competition that he uh, was created called Sing For Your Life. But um, uh, when I went to his house, it's uh, not only is it in Atlanta, which uh, this particular apartment is a little older, not very sound mm, proof or like good for audio, but not only that, but he had just that day had uh, like 24 hours prior, his dog had had a, um, a litter of puppies. So there are small uh, pug puppies and they're, you know, making noises and things like that. Plus uh, the mother dog was also uh, making all kinds of noise. So that was happening and I apologize for your ears, but um, I promise all the ones in 2020 will be much better quality. But since this is a older podcast, it is what it is. And I hope you can look past it and enjoy <laughs> keeping in mind the, mm, let's call it vintageness of this podcast. <laughs> Uh, but without further ado, let's get into it. Hey, Barry. Hi. Welcome. <laughs> um, so real quick to any listeners, mm. if you like this podcast or newrule.org, you can uh, uh, go support it if you'd like to at patreon.com, and all the information will be in the link below. So, moving on. Barry, welcome. Thanks. I'm so glad that we get to have you on here. I know, me too. Thanks for coming over to my apartment. I know it's very small, very petite. I know that you might hear dogs barking. It's because my dog had puppies just yesterday, so they're, we shifted them enough away, so hopefully yeah. we won't hear them in the mix. But if you hear it, that's what it is. Yeah. Day-old puppies. Day-old, so, 24 enjoy. hours. <laughs> okay, um, let's dive in. All right. So I like to start these with the past, so people can get to know you. So tell me about your childhood or impactful experiences or people growing up. Who, why do you think the way you think? You know, it's a funny start-off question, because normally um, that question comes much later, and then people are like, oh, now I understand why you think the way you do, or maybe sometimes I don't at all, but I don't know if you know this at all, I think you do, but I was born with a congenital heart defect, so I've had eight open-heart surgeries. Wow. So I had the first one when I was um, less than 24 hours old, so their age, <laughs> and the last one, I was 27, which was about, it doesn't matter how long ago, so... <laughs> So, um, yeah, I think just, you know, growing up in hospitals um, with many different kinds of people um, shifted my very interesting way of thinking about life because I think I think differently than most. Yeah. So so what exactly is that? Because, I mean, you can watch movies mm -hmm. about people who grow up in the hospital and get a glimpse, but I don't think that – maybe that doesn't necessarily represent. Is there anything – that I should know. Um, I, I always, I always honestly say that it's, I think it's wiser to ask those around the person because generally speaking, like my point of view will be the less point of view. There'll be less people like me that went through, you know, and not that I've gone through anything, but there are people who have gone through much worse. But what I'm saying is there's less people I think in the world that have gone through medical procedures that made them, you know, remain in hospitals and lead like many years in that capacity versus the family and friends that surrounded them because I think their way of thinking shifted more than mine. Really? You know what I mean? Okay. Because, well, because I think there's more people that can say, you know, my mom had cancer or my cousin had, you know, whatever. And I think that like the one person in it plus the 50 they affected, the 50 that they affected is a higher number, you know? That's fair enough. So, 
I don't even know how to really explain the way that I think, but I can tell you that it definitely shifted from not knowing anything other than the way that I think, mm -hmm. which I found out later in life was different than most. You okay. know what I mean? Because I had just had it from an early age. For sure. Yeah. So I guess what were then some of those things you realized that were different? <clears throat> um, well, I, I can tell you right now, um, I, I'm Italian, my family's from New York, and I grew up in Miami, so even those two things, they're, they're pretty multicultural cities, but I can say the color of someone's skin, their sexual orientation, their weight, their age, their, um, you know, whether they're handicapped or they have a medical condition or whatever, I don't think I ever saw that in anyone. I don't, I don't see that in anyone now. And I know that that's, maybe someone has said that before and people are like shrugging off that that's a weird thing, but I really mean it. Like when I look at someone, I don't see those things. I just see the person. And then all of that comes later, if it even happens at all. For sure. It's so just... that, that was a big thing. And I think living life, you know, because <clears throat> I never knew, not that I ever thought of this until I was older, but, you know, say the first 18 years of life, I think you just never really, you don't really know that you're different, right? Like, mm -hmm. that's all I ever knew. But once I turned 18, 19, when I really realized that um, everything that I had gone through had affected me in a different kind of way, is when... <laughs> is... <laughs> he's thirsty. Mm -hmm. Get that we, water. We probably should move the water bowl, don't you think? So that's where the champagne went. That's where the champagne normally <laughs> is, actually. He's usually drunk, too. Um, <laughs> that I realized later, as I got older, that, like, uh, every day really isn't, you know, necessarily going to be here. So I think I, I um, lead my life in a, in a sense that, not that I'm not planning for the future, because I do plan for projects and things and the way that I want to live my life, but I don't think 40 years down the road, the road as I think most people do, like preparing for right. retirement. Like, retirement. Right. I'm like, well, that's 40 years away, and I probably maybe have five. Not that I think I only have five, but you know what I mean. Yeah, like... I'm, I'm planning on more of the short-term, long-term than, like, super long-term, because I don't right. think that that really... I think that that makes people not actually live. That's fair enough. So, I, that's, a, that's a good point because I, the more I learn about language, the more I'm realizing that other languages don't necessarily have a concept of future or past and how much that can impact the way you think. Mm -hmm. And so if you already get a glimpse of the fact that well, you don't necessarily get to Right. Um, anyway. So... Uh, you said New York. No, she's drinking. Look at this. I'm sorry. All the drinking. This is what happens when you go on set and on location to someone's apartment. It's like um, pugs. There's six of them in here right now. So all the right. water drinking. All the and water drinking. Too. Just all the drinking. All the drinking. When you come to the house of Barry Brandon. <laughs> but there's no champagne here today. Normally uh, I drink almond champagne from Trader Joe's. It's $6.49 yeah. a bottle and it does a body good. Oh, they just have such a good selection. <laughs> they do. <laughs> um, okay. So, that, uh, that part of your past, definitely impactful. Yeah. Uh, I'd say. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think about your experience in New York and um, uh, South Florida? Uh, well, I was, I was born in Miami, in South Florida. I grew up in Fort Lauderdale, Coral Springs to be technical, but most people don't know it, so we say Fort Lauderdale. And then I lived in New York um, for years, and then Atlanta as well. I don't know... I don't really know how to answer that because I, where I grew up in Miami slash Fort Lauderdale, I think just like any city, you, I don't think you realize how it affected you really until you meet people who came from somewhere different. That's so, uh, you know, I've come across, like, I, I can answer this. I've come across people that have never stepped foot to like a pretty liberal city. Mm -hmm. I've met people that are transient or moved, you know, to New York that I met when I lived there from... Tennessee, mm -hmm. like an outskirt of two hours outside of Nashville, and they're like overwhelmed at the sense of self that you can be when you live somewhere different. So I, I mean, I think that I don't really know how to answer your question necessarily, but I can answer it the other way, which is I, it's plain as day and really clear when I see it the opposite way. And okay. I'm like, well, welcome to somewhere that you can finally feel free and liberated, you know? Yeah, for sure. That's, that's a, something I think people don't realize until they have it. But but the thing is, at the same time, I can't comprehend not feeling that way from birth. Oh, because you've had these experiences from birth. Well, I don't know really. I I mean maybe, but I but even like more than likely yes. But just knowing me as knowing myself, I can't imagine being anyone different. So I feel like even if I grew up in Mississippi, I would have still been the same person. 
I just would have been really out of place. <laughs> <laughs> but I would have been like the same outspoken. I don't know. Yeah, you I mean, maybe still be not, you, but but with different experiences, different knowledge base. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is turning into a therapy session. Ooh, I love it. <laughs> so, uh, what was your um, like? Did you go to college? Did you? What was your school? Like? No college. Um, I missed a lot of school. So my the, the, yeah, when I was in um elementary school, my mom had to fight to keep me in public school because at the time they didn't want me to be um, in public school. I don't actually, I don't really remember the reason. I don't think, I I really don't know what it was. I think they just hadn't ever come across someone like me before that was sick one day and healthy the next. And I think part of it probably had to do with the responsibility of the school and knowing my situation. So if anything happened, they had to like call 911 and relay information. It probably was pretty stressful for them. Um, and then throughout middle school and high school, same thing, you know, I, I would be fine one day and not the next. So I didn't wind up graduating high school um, because I was like a half credit short because they were, my high school tried to make it mandatory for me to take physical education, but I'm not supposed to do those things. So oh, the doctor was saying no and the school was saying yes and I wound up not. But then I went to get my, um, what is it, your GED or whatever, I got it in like an hour. They were like, an hour? did you want to study for this? I was like, I don't think I need to do that. I, just, I took it. Uh, and, then I, and I started going to college twice and had to leave again for um, complications. But what happened was between my seventh and eighth surgery, so I had the seventh one when I was um, like 14 and the eighth one when I was 27. So there was like a lingering period where I, ha I kept having these episodes, but they didn't want to go in because it wasn't bad enough. So I was just sort of living in a standstill, right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. once I had my last surgery is when I was able to start doing things. And at that point, I was like, well, I don't need to go to school for what I want to do. Yeah, so I'll just do it. Yeah. I like it. So yeah, I just did it. Um, yeah. Okay, so just out of curiosity, what were your interests when you were in school? Or was it just kind of wanting to get better? Um, no, you know, to be perfectly honest with you, my inspiration was Oprah Winfrey, always has been, since really? I, ever since I can remember. Um, yeah, I've looked up to Maya Angelou and Oprah and Bernadette Peters. I know, it's a weird combination. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, I remember watching, like, whenever I could, the Oprah Winfrey show, and then the older I got and the more that she expanded her brand. And not even, like, I mean, you know, she was doing the talk show for so long, and then all of a sudden she had this crazy website that connected you on Twitter and she was doing like little episodes of shows and she had her network like so I've been just watching her along the way and um, she definitely is someone that I look up to in many facilities I mean she's touched every area of entertainment um, she's a huge advocate for just like human to human interaction and she uses her um, her platform in such a positive way so you know, so I, 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 I eventually, when I look back on my career, um, I hope that it kind of parallels her. It's ambitious, but good. It's very, it's very well, I don't, need the, I don't need the money side of it. No, but it's I mean, but it's, dream. yeah. I like it. Um, okay. Are there any other impactful people or things that shaped you? Uh, probably my sister and my mom, you know. Um, they gave, you know, they, they gave a lot of their time and energy towards making sure I was good and staying for weeks and months at a time in hospitals and my sister took on a lot of um, financial responsibility uh, 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 financial responsibilities for me you know when I was in my tw early 20s mm -hmm. when I couldn't work and stuff um, so yeah them too hold on I'm going to put him in the bathroom I'm going to pause for a second because he's annoying pause he's annoying <laughs> hey hyper This is a new thing since she had them that like she feels someone's coming and she's like, they're not coming inside. They're not coming inside. They're not coming inside. You good? Go back to the babies. Piggy, they're not coming in here. Shh. They're not coming in here. They're not coming in here. Oh my 
Yeah, both of them. Sorry. You're good. They're honestly like, I know probably people say this stuff all the time, but they're really not these kind of dogs. I don't know what's going on. Eh, we'll blame it on Dale. She's just being protective of the puppies. Yeah, we'll just say Dale. But that's puppies. annoying. That's annoying. I'll just use that excuse for everything. How dare you want to protect your officer. How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. Um, so, let's move on to the present. Mm-hmm. What are you What are you doing with your life? Where are you at now? Oh my god, so many things. Um, well, I... Ugh. Hugs. He's okay. I am executive producing this show called Sing for Your Life, which you know about, but I'm not sure how many other people do. And it was um when I moved back to Atlanta from New York a couple years ago, my best friend in now, Jose, JL as people know him. Um, we felt like there was a, a lot missing from the Atlanta experience. Um in more ways than one, and not as literal as nightlife, because that's really not what it was, but it seemed to be lacking a space where all kinds of people came together for one reason or another. And it just so happened that my passion is music and so is his a songwriter. I was a, you know, a singer and recording and touring. And so we started off doing events and parties that kind of um, uh, were similar to that that we experienced in New York City mm-hmm. to start, because we figured like nightlife in and of itself is a, a stronger and easier platform than like starting a singing competition, you know, or doing yeah, music. Yeah. So we started in nightlife, started doing this party called Bedlam Presents, it was a monthly dance party that was, like, making waves in Atlanta because people were like, well, it's, like, a queer party, it's a gay party, it's a straight party, everyone's here, we don't know what to call it. The gay media was confused because they were like, we don't know how to call it when we write about it. And the straight media was like, we can't pick that up because it's gay people. Like, it's, <laughs> it was confusing, which is exactly what we wanted to do. Right. So um, we don't started with that. Box. Don't put me in a box. So we started with that, and we started at this small little um, venue in, in uh, East Atlanta called I Lounge. Mm-hmm with like maybe 60 or 70 people at the first party and eventually it grew to like four or five six hundred I whacked up blackout in our bigger events okay. and so after about two and a half years of doing that yeah tell what black, black out blackout is because I love that one. oh what's up blackout is a glow-in-the-dark black light body paint party so there's <laughs> a DJ really fun. there's a paint tent you walk in you check your clothes in and you go get painted and you just dance under the black light and super you know we, the, the point of the, the themes and the costumes that we thought would be the, the that would be what would get everyone in and not see each other's all those things we talked about earlier right you would see, see this colors. costume and you'd be like, oh my God, you look so great. And before you knew it, you were speaking to someone who was like 59 with three kids and you're 22 in college. And you would have maybe never met that person before, but here you are enjoying a drink, dancing to good music. And then you're like, now you're my friend, you know? Yeah. So um, we started having all these different themes and the event was really successful. And then through that, um, I was still recording music and touring. He was songwriting mm-hmm. for me. And then we started doing art parties and just it just kept going, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, then one day we were like, let's focus in on the singing competition. So that's really what I'm doing now is hyper-focusing on that event because I really want to get it televised. Okay. Um, and you've obviously been to it before. Like, mm-hmm. you were at it season one because your friend was in it. Mm-hmm. And then you were at it season two because you were, you know, helping working, out. helping. So um, you kind of see it from both sides. But yeah, it's a little bit of a different twist than other seeing competitions on show on, on television art because they're more about like the judges or just like making money off the artists but ours is more about the development and like mm-hmm. making them really great and the more budget we have the more we can really develop them and they can be released you know after they enter as like a strong artist who feels that they can represent themselves and for sure you know be branded and stuff like that so just just so people can get a better idea of what what would you say is like the main thing that's different from the other uh, singing competitions or the things that are similar like well there's a lot of similarities in the sense that there's a top 12 and then obviously one wins so I think in any competition in order to make it successful and make people excited to come out and watch it um, there has to be an element of someone winning something you know right. um, and there's similarities in the sense that like there's themes every week I think I think uh, maybe American Idol does that I don't know if The Voice does that maybe they do I'm not sure mm-hmm. um, what's different you know, what our vision is, which will come out the more we have a budget. So if you guys want to give us money, <laughs> you can help our vision expand. Because um, eventually, like I said, it, it will be really artist development. And the thing about it that, that makes it different as well is, like, uh, it's gay produced, meaning it's not a gay show in the sense that 
you can be straight, you can be gay, you can be black, you can be white. But I think for the other shows that are on television, you might have a gay person on it, but it's probably a thing, right? Like, it's right. the gay guy. Or so it's like token instead. It's of like the token gay guy instead of you seeing that person for who they are. So that's a big difference between us is that it's the opposite perspective, meaning that we don't care what you look like. We just want you to be really talented. We don't care about where you were from or anything like that. You know, I think another major difference about it is that it was created from artists for artists. So the team behind it, um, from the mentors to the judges to everyone, they're working industry professional artists in some capacity. So you know, I'm not trying to make a million dollars off of this singer when they win. I'm actually, like, our entire team is hoping to know them after the show and network. And then, you know, you win, win the show and then you ask Michael Robinson to choreograph your music video and be your backup dancer. And you ask me to assist with whatever. And you ask Josette to assist with whatever. So it's more of an artist um, networking platform. Mm -hmm. and more collaborative and more development than you coming on the show, winning a record deal, and then you're off to do whatever, you know? For sure. But they're, they're just trying to ship you out. Ship you, you out, get you in, ship you out. And, like, we, we try to still, you know, every season, we try to bring the people back that finish their commitment and have them perform and guest judge and mentor. And then this year we're doing a Sounds of Jail record. So we're taking, like, six people from season one, six from season two, and they're going to record original material that they performed on the show that he wrote. So we're... You know, it's like a working a working musician networking family. Nice. Yeah. I like it. I yeah. Like it. And I think it's more fun, too, because, you know, it's it's in nightlife and it's live. So there's I think there's more comedy and more light. Um, I don't know. I, I just think that the, that the energy of the show is different because it's, it's funny and it's improv and it's on the spot and there's less rules mm -hmm. than there are when you watch those other television shows because they're so like... Definitely. Well, they're, yeah, they have to choreograph for the network and everything else. The thing that I really like is that it is local. So these people, yeah. the people that you can know that live in your community, like you just sit there and then talk to them after the show. It's right there. Right. That's kind of cool. You, I don't know. There's not, like, even if you went to L.A. and sat in on a show for, like, The Voice or whatever. Right. Good luck talking to those people. <laughs> yeah, you'd be watching it, and then you'd be like, you know, bye. Mm -hmm. your, your connection will have been that you saw them on stage. And this is, like, they come out, you know them, you meet them. And eventually down the road, you know, the bigger picture is that we do keep the show produced here in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. um, but eventually we'll, we'll expand the audition process to anyone from all over the country. But we still want to maintain what you just said. It, it, I don't I don't think that the show will ever become something that the artists that you're coming to see are untouchable in the sense that, like... Oh, we're special. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with me because I'm not that way. I've never been that way. And even when I was a touring artist and recording and working in studios and producing my own tour and all of that, I never was that way. Um, and I never had those crazy, like, write-ups where it was, like, the green room has to have two bottles of wine with peanut <laughs> M&Ms and don't talk to me. It was never, it's actually the, completely the opposite. Mm -hmm. Because I feel as though the only way to make it in this industry is to, like, really, truly know your fan base and your following and your friends and, and really have them um, want to support you because you're great at what you do and then you're also friendly and personable and a real human being. Right. You know? Yeah. So I think it, that stems all the way down from the top because I don't think anyone on the team producing it is that way. Therefore, we don't develop them and teach them in that way. Which is good. I think any business. I think it's good, but some yeah. people are like, you know, some people are the opposite. They're like, the thing about being, you know, an artist is like, there's a wall, so then you can't know me that much and you can't know me that well. And I'm like, I mean, I get that if you're Britney Spears and you have to have someone helping yeah. protect you from five million people that are trying to like but even then steal your coffee you know what I mean but, right right but it's kind of so, so I met uh, Daniel Radcliffe at one point when he was doing a Broadway show and the thing that struck me about him is like talking to some of the other crew around there he actually sits out there all day like afterward with more people than anyone on Broadway ever gets sitting outside waiting for the show just because he was here. Probably. Even after the show? Yeah, after and the so show. He, yeah. And he just sits there and talks to as many people as possible and tries to put an effort because he has the acknowledgement that, hey, I'm not famous because me, I'm famous because of the character. Right. And I think that's a very humble way to look at it. So I'm always in favor of people. With that yeah. Mentality. Yeah. And I think it makes you want to support them more too. You exactly. know what I mean? Like, you know, you were you were so great on stage, and I tell you that, and then you're you're so thankful, and then you say, you know, come back and see me next week, and we'll talk again, and that person remembers, you know, the artist remembers the person, and it just sort of 
trickles down. I don't know. You know who was like that? Was um, you know who is like that? Is Indy called the pop star? Ah, oh, yeah. She's really, really good about that. Um, like saying hello to everyone after the show and talking to every person there, and she was really good about that. Definitely, and she is so phenomenally talented. And you, you sit down with her, and she's just, oh my god, I love the you're like she's yeah. all about you, which is kind of awesome. Yeah, you don't get that too much. I feel like super, super talented people. No, it's easy to get more. Yep. Um, that's, that's for sure. <laughs> I've worked with a couple of them, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> no names, no names, no names. No, 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 no shame, no shame. Um, so, with, uh, got Sin for Your Life, Black Out, Black Out, Bedlam, all those things. What else? Uh, you, you've got so many different projects. Oh, I am, um, so, I'm at a transition right now, uh, about a month ago, I had made, well, I made the conscious decision before that, but last month implemented it publicly that um, I'm really out of nightlife at this point. Okay. Um, I'm still doing Sing Free Life, which some might call it nightlife, but I call it a show. Um, Whacked Up Blackout is definitely nightlife, and we're going to keep that going because people love it. And, um, but I'm really removing myself from, from nightlife because it was really never where I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. um, the whole point and the concept of that was to just create a team and meet people and network and, and kind of like... Um, connect artistically to build other other projects and stuff. So, through it all, my I um, one of my I think one of my fortes is branding. So I've shifted into creative consulting work. Okay. Um, where you can hire me to you know consult about your brand and help you design your logo and help build your website. I don't build it. I have people that build it. You got people. <laughs> I, have, I have people that build the website, but like, you know, come with the concept and the theme and the colors and go into your restaurant or your hotel or whatever and just help you arrange it all and get it going. That makes, makes sense, you know, and so social media, and social media and, um, and I also freelance produce large scale events. So I work a lot with a company called C3 Agency. They're based here in Atlanta, half here and half in Brooklyn. And I've been with them for a little over a year. So we've done some um, really cool big projects for Virgin America and Virgin Atlantic and something for Google. That's awesome. Yeah. That's really cool. Uh, is that is that more where you see yourself then? Eventually, no. I actually I what I would love to do eventually is have a talk show. Really? Yeah. Okay. I can see that. Yeah. I can definitely do that. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of that, you know. Um, I do want to, I love the creative world and I love everything that I'm doing, but eventually like my long term long term goal is would be to have a talk show. And um, whether it was by myself or with a group, because I already have an idea in my head that I've had for years, mm -hmm. <laughs> of course, um, it involves Michael Robinson as well. And we've talked about it and we are ready to move forward, but it just hasn't been the right time. And got to go, gotta get the concept out and, you know, all those, all those fun things that make people not <laughs> move forward. We will move forward, but we're just haven't done it yet. Definitely. So yeah, a talk show would be good. Work in progress. I'm yeah. definitely familiar with that. <laughs> <laughs> All too well. All too well. Um, okay. Uh, anything else? No. Well, I mean, do you, this looks like R two D two. This is my or C three PO with R two D two. R two D two. Yeah. The uh, the just like him actually. But just yeah. If only he went. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's my blue, blue yeti mic. He's cute. Um. So, let's take a look at what you find important. Like, what issues impact your life that you are, are worth paying attention to? Oh, uh, well, God. I know it's a big topic. What annoys, I can tell you what annoys me. Okay, Religious fine. debates annoy me. Uh, Religious I have debates. a, yeah, I have a really big problem, and I always have since I was very, very young. Um, with organized religion, it irritates the shit out of me because, um, not all of them, actually, I think the Buddhist religion is really cute. Um, anything involving like Jesus to me is absurd because every religion that's based on his teachings is the opposite of what he actually taught. Okay. And this annoys me. Um, any religion that teaches that you should think that you're above someone else for any particular reason is annoying to me. So I have a problem with religion and I have a problem that people hide behind it and make statements that hide behind words in a book that no one knows who wrote that, you know, who wrote that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and the intent behind it was actually probably more than likely the opposite of how you're using it to make your point. Right. So Pretty it's annoying. The, uh, translations over this. Yeah, it's just, you know, I mean... 
whether you think Jesus was a Messiah or not, or whether you think he was just a person that walked the earth that was like a good person, or whether you think he was an alien, because some people do, including myself. <laughs> Jesus and alien too, yeah. Um, I can see the. Doctor. I just think he was just so simple. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. love your neighbor. Don't judge. Don't kill him. Don't hurt him. Don't be there. Here's here's bread for you when you don't have it. Here's he, he, he turned water into wine. I mean, <laughs> this is like if this doesn't tell you what kind of man this was, like this is you know. So yeah, it annoys me when people use it um, to make points on hatred, and also social issues. It's written. To me, like, the stuff with um, gay marriage, and here's the thing, like, I'm gay, right? But, again, in the same sense that I said before, where no matter what I was born, I would have, I would be the same me. If I was living in the 50s and 60s, I would have been front runner for the civil rights movement because everything that makes someone less than irritates me. So I, I have, like, I'm not someone who thinks that I'm ever going to get married. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. I don't think that I will. I never thought that I would. But... It annoys me that you're telling someone that they can't do something because you're afraid of... Because you don't like it. I don't know what. Like, what's the point? I don't know. Um, Yeah, it's very weird. Uh, So, yeah, I I think anything... I think what I'm trying to say is things annoy me where anyone or any group of people is putting down another group based on non-logic. Non-logic. That's that's the most annoying thing in my life. Arguing over beliefs rather than... Facts. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're arguing about facts. Like, show me the car facts, or I don't want to talk about it. You know what I mean? It's really, it's really simple. Get out of my house. Yeah. Goodbye. I like it. Um, <laughs> okay. okay. I'm a simple person. You know what I mean? Yeah. At the end of the day. But I think that's a good, a good thing to point out is that people don't pay attention to. Like, we should just agree on what the facts are before we even start debating. Totally. Which. You know, small plug for NewWorld.org website I made, which is the whole point is to organize facts, opinions, and solutions to every issue. Ah, so it's my favorite thing I've ever heard. Right? I mean, we I think it's really the world. I think it's brilliant, actually. <laughs> That's a really so. Okay. Just a plug. Any of you curious about what that means? Go to NewWorld.org. I love it. That's what I like. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a great thing to be irked about. I think yeah, people need to stand up more for what they believe in, or at yeah. least know what they believe in before they start talking. Totally. And and the other thing is, like, I've spent time in Europe. I was there for three months in 2012 and three months this past summer. And, uh, you know, another interesting point to me is over there, in many of the countries and cities, like, um, who are much older than we are in the States, mm-hmm. mind you, let's remember that, is that it's funny to me that they're so open about some things that we're not, and then we're not, but it's like... I, I would think that we would look at where we came from and realize that that's working and that's great and that's, you know what I mean? Like, you yeah. came here to start something new, which is also great that you thought that you could expand on what wasn't great, but then you reverted from the things that were wonderful and great that were working for everyone, and then you opposed it. You know, so, like, th- things with nudity. Like, I have no problem with nudity. You know what I mean? I don't really have a problem with anything. I don't really have a problem with anything. They're the worst. Hey, Piggy, what are you barking at? Future Heath here. Uh, just gonna go ahead and skip through all the barking nonsense and get back to the podcast. Uh, oh, we were talking about Europe, is what we were talking about. Europe. And okay. culture. And the difference between, like, you know, how we... Oh, nudity and prostitution and all these things. Should we go there? Sure. Um, yeah, no, I really don't have a problem with, with many things, you know? Uh, prostitution, I think, should be legalized. Mm-hmm. Um, For so many reasons. For a million reasons. I just think that you have no right to tell me what to do with my body. I don't tell you what to do with yours, so I don't know why you think you can tell me what to do with mine. Um, Assisted suicide, you know, uh, if you're terminally ill, um, and it's going to be an extremely painful situation. You know, I shouldn't even put legalities on it. Like, if you think it's your time to go, then you should be able to pay someone to help you go in in a way that... Yeah, I... Overall, here we go again, like an umbrella thought, is I, what irks me also is people telling me what to do with my body. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, basically, I have an issue with anyone telling me how to control my life. So because I, mean, I don't think that I should care what you do with yours, and I don't think you should care what I do with mine. Mm-hmm. Um, I think where you get into the gray area is when it's, it's issues that affect others through something. So like gun control. That's a gray area for me because I'm like, well, if you tell someone that they can have it, then you're implying that someone will have it and then someone won't, which means that there's going to be a situation in some capacity where someone's using it and I'm not. 
So, yeah, yeah. you know, there's there's areas like that. And, like, you know, cert- certain drugs. Like, I don't have a problem. Um, marijuana, legalize it. Shrooms, legalize them. Acid, legalize it. But when you talk about heroin with needles that could, you know, implement diseases through someone for stepping on it or picking it up. So, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. most things, I'm like, do whatever you want. It doesn't affect me. But I think where you come to the gray area is, like, the ones that do affect everyone when there's something else involved. Which is fair enough. And um, I think we need to, I just think it's 2000, almost 15, and I think we need to reevaluate where we stand on those issues that do affect everyone and talk about tweaking and fixing those and then stop all the ridiculous nonsense about the ones that don't matter to anyone. I like it. <laughs> I want to run for president, too. Yes, very for president. <laughs> or Oprah. Or Oprah. That would be... She'd be great, right? That would be interesting. She would fund her own campaign. She wouldn't owe anyone favors when she got in office. This is true. My brother Bobby always says, he's like, um, he, he's like I th- he thinks that they should make it um, that when you're running for presidency that you wear patches on your jacket of all the companies that gave you money, of yeah. all your supporters, so that we know when you get in office where all your loyalties and money is going. Interesting. Good I would, point, right? Have you, have you heard of uh, Wolfpack? No. It's a thing, same, you know the Young Turks? It's a um, it's a news channel on YouTube and a bunch of other places, but uh, it's it's basically just news without the, the studio. But they do the exact same thing, and they give you a more what they consider a more honest uh, view on it. But yeah. anyway, they started this group called Wolfpack, which it's uh, trying to get an amendment where you get money out of politics. So they're trying to get everyone to sign on and be oh. like, "Hey, we can actually do this." <laughs> um, but anyway, I had a point there. Anyway, um, yeah. Oh, oh. I think personally, just yep. opinion, we should just have every politician have cameras on. Like that's reality TV. The totally. Cameras, like that'll solve a lot of problems. Well, recently I read somewhere. I don't. I don't know how far this got or how real this is, but I read something that um, in a county. I think it was in California, maybe LA, maybe. They wanted to implement cops to wear cameras on them at all times. They're yeah, just facing outward to see how they're interacting with everyone. Definitely. And I think that that makes per- that's again that's so logical to me because if you're in a position of power and you're able to manipulate a situation because of your role and what you do for a living, then by all means, if you're being fair and honest and real about your work, then you shouldn't have a problem wearing a camera so everyone can see exactly how you're doing your job. Definitely. Well, and, and take it further, it actually got implemented. Oh, forget, did it? I forget where, but they did it. And then the uh, rate of um, people calling in about police abuse went down. Of course it did. Way, way. Well, like, of course it did, because now you can't talk to me like that, and you can't just arrest me for no reason. And there's going to be less, you know, uh, gray area confusing situations. But I will tell you, in that county, don't be surprised if they get rid of the law, because the court systems are not making all the money that they need to make. Mm-hmm. So... If we had Google Cars... The what? If we had Google Cars, that would get rid of their income, too. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it kind of weird that we have a public utility that we pay taxes for, and then somehow they have to make money by extorting it from us? Yes. That doesn't make sense to me. No sense. I'm so confused. Well, there are many things in this world that don't make sense, and the thing is, the smarter that we get as people, the more things don't make sense, and the more that people in power with money don't they have to, it's scary for them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because the more free thinking individuals that we get, the more people realize how fucked up the world is. And then, then it's a problem. And it is. And then awareness. Oh, awareness. Oh, (laughs) oh, awareness. Um, okay. So, uh, transparency in politics. Yep. We've got, we should legalize prostitution. Yep. We should legalize drugs, which in Portugal they did, like back in the early 2000s. Yeah, all drugs? I'm pretty sure they decriminalized it and treated their uh, people who were addicted as patients that's, and not criminals. I think that's exactly what it should be. Well, what well. do you know? All the rates of abuse and violence went down. And but, you know, here in the States, everyone makes money off of something. So it's really difficult to add logic to our country when our country is based on money and power. <laughs> it's a problem, isn't it? Yeah. That's why everybody should move to Berlin, Germany, everyone. Berlin, yes. Like, greatest place I've ever been, and I will be moving there. Good to know. So what, what did you like about Berlin? Everything. Everything. You name it, and I liked it. Really, and I mean that, and I mean that seriously. Um, it's an inter- international city. You have people from all over the world, everywhere. Um, 
you know, I think because of its history, um, you know about the Berlin. I mean, obviously, you know World War One, World War Two, and then you know Berlin Wall as well. And so the wall only came down like eighty eight, eighty nine. Yeah, eighty nine. And um, and so you still have people that are hyper aware of living during that. And then it's like the first generation is so hyper aware of it also. So there's a really strong sense of individuality there, where um, Berliners, and I think Germans in general, but particularly Berliners. Now, I don't want to speak for them because I'm not a citizen of Germany, but from what I've witnessed and being there and talking to people that are from there and raised there and live there, it seems that they have such a such a strong sense of, it, like, that do not tell me what to do. Like, they will not allow themselves to be controlled again. And um, and, it's, and it's, it's gone so far in the way of, like, you see drag, king, drag queens walking down the street in, like, nine-inch heels. Oh, and, wow. like, with, like, five-year-olds saying hello and taking, like, a candy bar from the drive. Like, I don't know how to explain it. It's it's so, um, like, I'll tell you firsthand two things that confused me. Like, not confused me. I loved it, but I was confused because of where I was born and where I was raised. I was sitting in a bar with a friend. We were having a drink at a high-top table, and there was a woman sitting behind us that neither one of us knew that tapped on the table, and she said, can you do me a favor? And she was German, but I can't do the accent. And she said, I just have to use the restroom. Can you watch my baby for one second? And the person I was with who was German was like, of course, went to the bathroom, came back. So I'm not saying anything. I'm waiting for him to tell me that he thinks that this is abnormal because oh, I'm like, thinking what, what something <laughs> like, did she, is she running from it? What the hell is going on? Comes back, says, thank you. They speak in German really quickly. She goes back to the table. An hour later, she leaves. So I turned to him and I'm like, look, I'm not saying that that was abnormal because to me, in theory, that should be normal. But is that normal? He was like, yeah, what's the problem? I was like, that would never happen in the United States because they would think Facts. you're going to kill them. like all of it someone's <laughs> going to call the cops someone's going to take the baby you're going to think the other situation is like dogs there they walk down the street next to you with no leash like they're train 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 right so like you can go to the park and you're riding your bike and they're running behind and then you can almost bring a dog anywhere in restaurants and bars but there's a couple places they can't go like grocery stores I think you know so like food safety issues or something. but not even all of them like the little markets you can bring them in but the you know higher end like they don't have public there but like the public's version of what they have right. you can't bring the dog so what do they do they leave the dog sitting right outside no leash just chill sitting and I'm like aren't you afraid someone's going to take your dog they're like who would ever take someone's dog so it's actually the it's the logic that I have in my head that I think people are nuts for doing they have it the other way they're like why would you ever think that someone would steal my baby? I just have to use the restroom. And I'm like, no, I, I love that about you, but also that scares me. So, um, and not to say they're all like that, but I had experiences like that. And so that's what I'm saying. Using those as examples of um, significant culture. Just a way, of, a way of life that just, you know, uh, a, a Germans uh, culturally, they're based on logic. So everything there, most things there make sense. If there's a rule for it, then there's a reason for it. And if you ask someone, what is that for? They're going to tell you what it is, which okay, no. we don't really have that here. Turn yeah. on the heat for the dogs. Um, and then, um, and then the other thing is just like the art, the art, art scene there. Like it's like everyone's an artist. Just, just all of them. It's street art, crazy. There's exhibitions and, um, conceptual art development, like you name it and it's there. People come from all over the world to be there for the art scene. And you said you've been to other parts of Europe, yeah? Mm -hmm. So do you think that that's something uh, that developed in Germany, or is it just more <clears throat> European? Eastern European, for sure. I spent a lot of time... Um, every country and city is so different from one another, but there is a common... There's a clear difference between Western Europe and Eastern Europe. Like, very, very, very clear, different way of life. And um, from everyone that I spoke to, because I was in Prague and Budapest and Berlin, which are all, you know, well, Berlin's like half and half, right? Anyone right, who's <laughs> under control from the Soviets, you know what I'm saying, um, have a really, really different perspective on life. There's very little religion um, over there at all. Um, a lot of it has to do with the fact that during the time that the wall was up and they were being controlled, after all of these things, they were like, well, you told me for so long that I... You know, going to church and tithing and doing these things would bring me what brings me what brings me what brings me nothing. So, um, and I and, and not to imply that religion is bad because I keep I've said a couple things about it, 
But I think like the more free thinking that you are, the more that you realize that organized religion in and of itself doesn't actually make any sense. Mm -hmm. Not not spirituality. That's totally different. But to feel the need to go somewhere, to listen to someone preaching and put thoughts in your mind yeah. and funnel money into an organization where the priests are making $200,000 a year and you're yeah, like kind of poor like. and you're giving away the $5 that you have. This is a very strange... The yeah. churches are $5 million establishments with like gold and marble with these new C3 churches with like um, brand new $50,000 sound systems. You know what I mean? Right, it's right. Just, it's having concert concert. Inside. You're having it's concerts and you have drop down screens with projection and you're paying your audio visual person $500 a week, a thousand a week to do this. Probably more. I don't know what they pay them, but like the building alone is $20 million. So didn't right. you want to take that money and give it to the poor? Like, yeah, right. it's just, it's, Conflicting with it's your stated... Whole, right. It's the whole, like, that whole loophole circle thing of religion with not free thinking with all of that is, I, I um, in my experience, um, over in those cities that I mentioned, um, it's going away. They're much more uh, aware of life in a different way. Definitely. You know? So, question. Yeah. I think a lot of people think, oh, if you're not religious, then you're atheist. And not that that's good or bad, but would you say that that was your experience? Or was it more that they're just more spiritual in their own way? Uh, more spiritual in their own way. I think everyone at the end of the day is spiritual in their own way. Even people that say they don't believe in religion, they're atheists, they're whatever they are. It doesn't matter what you say you, you are. In your head, there is a sense of spirituality because you're alive and you're seeing all these things around you and you can't help but wonder, what like, what does it all mean? Like, where am I going when I die? Where was I before here? Like... Not to say everyone thinks about all of those things, but I think each person in the world has some sort of thought about, like, what is it all, you know? Yeah. So even if, you're, if your version of spirituality is not believing that you go to heaven when you die and you believe that you just become one with the earth, that's still a spiritual way to look at it because you still think that you're going to pass away and your energy and your body is going to remain here, you know? So... Yeah. I think everyone has some sense of spirituality, but I think religion and spirituality are not the same. And people oftentimes use them as an example to show that someone is not religious by saying that you're, what am I trying to say? It's like, it's almost like I'm speaking down to you because I'm implying that you're not religious, but I don't right. care. That's, I would, I never was and I never will be, but I am spiritual, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. I just think they're different. Well, they are. And it's just like anything else. When you look at a star, it's this little tiny speck. The closer you get, though, the more complex it is. Right. The more nuanced. And I think it's like that with everything. Yeah. So, like, when I get to know Barry Brandon in a podcast, there's more complexity than just seeing him on stage or something. Darn it. That's annoying. <laughs> <laughs> Ugh. Not that you are plenty of complexity. <laughs> I'm kidding. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <but>. um, <Yeah. laughs> okay. So, are there any uh, local to Atlanta issues that uh, seem like something we should focus on? Um, you know, I don't know enough about the politics of Atlanta to talk about that. Yeah. But things that I noticed that are annoying, um, the public transportation system, um, which, you know, it's, to me, the bigger picture of it all is still the black-white issue because I still see it here. I still experience it. Yeah. And um, I think that, like, from the not great education in certain areas outside of Atlanta, south of the city, whatever. Um, there, like to me, it's all connected. There's like a cycle, right? Like it's still not equal. There's still areas that don't have as good of an education. There's still areas that you can, are not accessible via public transportation. So like you're not allowing people to get, get better. You know what I mean? Right. Better is the wrong word. Not get, um, you're not allowing them uh, the same opportunities. Right. Like, and I feel as though it's like the public transportation in and of itself is a major um, wall that is not allowing the opportunity to happen. Because people that live in East Atlanta cannot get to East Cobb to work. And in East Cobb, there's opportunity and money and, and growth opportunities. And but if you don't have a nice enough car, you can get there. Right. You can't afford gas. Right. So I think, um, I just think that there's a, there's still the black and white issue here. And I think that for whatever reason, someone is stopping the opportunity 
to happen. Like there, there's some kind of yeah. issue well, with not wanting to make it equal well, everywhere. Because you know, it's it's like Marta was designed with this problem. At least this is my understanding of it. That the only way they can raise money to improve infrastructure is by raising the rates. There's like they literally can't use anything else to get money. So how are you going to expand? Because raising the rate negatively impacts the people who are using it in the first place. Right, because they're the ones that can't afford to have a car, and that's why they're taking that. Mm -hmm. right. So, like, that's... that's nonsensical. Just, that's intentionally breaking it in the design. But that's like, nonsensical, which is annoying. Yeah. So, again... Or, like, using the highway system to cleft the Martin Luther King district in half. And destroy the community. Yeah, like, that was a, definitely a part of it. <sighs> like, come on now, like... And I hear there's still the gay issue here, too. Like, um, a lot of my gay friends feel like they're still not, like, all the way equal. But I can never speak on that because in any place that I've ever traveled, and I've been to not everywhere, but a lot of places in the States and in, in Europe, and I have never felt less than wherever I go. But I also have a really strong sense of self and mm -hmm. presence when I walk into a room. So I think that I almost don't allow it to be that way. Not to imply that people are not. Like that's not. I don't mean to imply that like my friends are weak in any capacity. I just mean that I'm probably stronger than most in a sense of when I walk into a room, like I demand that you don't act any kind of way towards me. And if you do, then I'm going to say something, and you probably know that. Yeah. You'll, so you'll nip it in the bud, call it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's. I, but I, I I've never experienced it here myself. Ah. Future Heath here, and the piggy pups have struck again. Now let's get back to the podcast. Okay. Sorry. Um, All these interruptions, huh? I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. No, you're fine. My sister just got here with my nephew and my dad's here. They're here to see the piglets. <laughs> no worries. I tried to time it after. I was like 3.30. Oh, I didn't even know. Okay. I gotta let that in. Okay, well. I'm just going in. It just will go in there. Okay. I'm sorry. No, time. Dad? He's gonna follow you. Dad? Uh, so something I've noticed is, or at least I've heard from my friends, is the farther away from the city you get, as a gay person, sometimes it's more and more difficult to feel accepted by the community. I hear that too. Was that... What, what I've, I've never lived outside of a major city, so I wouldn't know. Fair enough. I hear it, and I get where it comes from, and I think it makes perfect sense. I mean, it's again, it's logical. Like, a, a, a small town is going to have small-minded people who have known each other for years with very little new, um, you know new new way of life, new things, new ideas, new concepts being introduced because they're probably just comfortable with where they are. Yeah. Um, and comfort, that kind of comfort breeds not. Yeah, well, lack of diversity. Yeah. It'll do it. Uh, but I do hear that there's a much lower IQ in small towns than there are in major cities, so it makes sense that someone would not be... <laughs> I don't know. Well, so I've lived in... I've lived on a farm. I've lived in, like, suburbia, both in Ohio, like, low end, and then a little higher end here in, in Georgia, and also in Kansas. And what I've noticed is that, especially in Georgia, when I came to these smaller areas, like Flower Branch, like Buford, like all that... What I find is that it was the same chain stores every single exit up the highway yeah. from Atlanta all the way up to an hour north. Yeah. And I don't know how you can have any sense of pride or control in your community when none of the stores are run by people in the community, they're right. by corporations. Well, it's, yeah, it's, um, I mean, yeah, 100%. I'm trying to think of the way to respond to that. I think that, um, that same mentality of like a corporation running a Walmart in every small town with a Chili's and an Applebee's and whatever, that breeds. That's but the thing is that some people like that. Okay, I'll use this as an example. I used to be a concierge of a hotel in New York at the London NYC, and it was a five star property, and we had pop stars that stayed there, and celebrities, and actors, and musicians, whatever. And every once in a while, we would get um, someone that would come in with their family that wanted to go eat at the Olive Garden in Times okay. Square. And it never confused me. I got it from the beginning, but I remember the other concierges because they were from New York and lived there for 20 years. And they were like, oh my God, I can't believe it. I'm like, but don't you get it though? There is a sense of like comfort. Like it's what you know. There's a large portion of people that don't want to know more than they know. They don't want to experience more than they've experienced and they don't want to interrupt their comfortable life. And because interruption makes you think 
And that's why people, I think, live in small towns and small areas because you know who you know. It's your family. That's your neighbor. You know how to do this job. You know what your place is. You know what you're supposed to do. You get it. You know it. And I don't really think that that's a bad thing necessarily. I think that just is something that you would get around the world wherever you are, people that are comfortable. But I think when you get to major cities, that's when you have like-minded individuals in the sense of the more that you know. Mm-hmm. the more that you can do and the more that you can reach and the more things that you can you know, develop and all that kind of thing. So, uh, I don't know. I think, like, I think I, I totally get where it comes from. Okay. It's small town. But I think it's absurd. <laughs> but, but you bring up a good point. If Because I don't think there should be a problem with people that want I mean, to stay in a small area. That right. want, like, that's fine. I just feel like it should be done in a way that doesn't negatively impact the community. Right. But that's the thing. You, like, that's a very difficult uh, combination of things to get because the whole point is that I don't want... That's the whole thing is I live here because this is the way that this works and this is the way this town is. Mm-hmm. But it's not sustainable. Um, is it not, though? No, it's not. Everything about our lives in America, the food we eat, the car we drive, the clothes we wear, it all language impacts people around the world. We use too many resources to buy too much crap. We don't really earn it. But in a lot of small towns, they're pretty, uh, as much as we can say there's a Walmart and there's a whatever, There, a lot of people are, they're farm towns, so they're growing their own crops and they're... No, they're not. They're growing for other companies. Like, some people... But they might all... But very few. Really? Yeah, I grew up in Canada. Well, you would know more than I. I'm just... Yeah. yeah. I mean... I mean because like well, you know how Monsanto works, right? Yeah. Like, seed. So so that's that's uh, tenant farming essentially. That's not growing your own stuff. And somehow you're but growing if, all these acres, and then you don't have any food. But are they they're not keeping any of it at all for themselves? What are you going to keep corn? And yeah, then no, even if you did, because it depends on the crop that you're growing, right? Yeah, totally. Even yeah, if you did, it's well, I hear and again, I don't know if this is true, but I hear like in, for example, Europe, we they can't even buy our foods here to import them. They can't. It's illegal for them to eat our meat. And um, I'm sure there's other food too. Like I don't know what they are. You would know more than I. But um, that's another interesting thing. It's like that's a whole other topic of conversation, which is our food, food and oil and all of that. Which is it's controlled here to the point that we, as free people, can't even get away from the shit food. <laughs> yeah. And like they can't even. They're not even allowed to eat what we have here. There. That's how much they're like. You don't. Our people are not eating that. Exactly. People talk about China like, oh, it's got lead in our river. It's like, how about all the crap that's in our stuff? Right. <laughs> Come on now. Right. I don't understand. We do have for hours about that. Yeah. We Especially do. you, because you're doing this new farming thing. But, or, well, not farming, but yeah, well, the yeah. mushroom thing. Different sustainable. Which I don't know enough about. I need to know more. But yeah. you just told me two seconds ago, so. We, we can talk about that. <laughs> uh, yeah. There's, there's, it's, it's a very interesting world the dynamics between things and what people think versus what reality is. It's very interesting. Not yes. that I know everything, but I feel like the more I learn about, the more I realize how conflicted everything is, which frustrates me. <laughs> I'm like, why are we doing it this way? It's very frustrating. Well, I've, I've come to learn that the reason that we do things is not because of reasons, because of money. And if you know that going in and you're able to see what the issue is, then it either is worth your time to try to correct or fix it, or you just walk away from that and be like, that's not for me. Because I'm so far removed from so many things that I know that, you know, I used to get annoyed at so many things and frustrated for other people because of things happening. And I was like, at the end of the day, I don't, I can't be annoyed by that. You know, it's pick and choose your battles, really. Right. But on the larger scale, though, um, more people that get annoyed by money and power need to come together to eventually try to make that go away. Because yes. Well, I don't even have a problem with like money and power, right? Greed, people feel that greed is a bad thing. I honestly don't. I think it's just, it is what it is and it needs to be managed so it goes in the best possible direction. Like, so, give people the, the hope of, hey, you can make lots of money. Don't, you know, poison the people with your product and you're good. Yeah, no, I agree with that 100%. Yeah, no, I'm not, by all means, I'm a capitalist. Like, I think if you create a company and grow something, like, make a gazillion dollars off of it. But at the same time, I feel as though if you've made all that money, then you need to use your money to help other people too. Tax. But here's the thing. I want to know where my tax dollars are going. So I don't have a problem paying 30% tax. I just want you to tell me where it is that it's going. Who's getting it? Or better yet, give me 10 options a year to choose from where I want my tax dollars to go so I know who I'm helping. You know? That's right. But, uh, yeah. I believe that people should be able to make all the money in the world. But I truly believe that those people should be required to assist. 
as as the rest of us should be. Everyone yeah. should be. But you're making twenty million, so you should give. You're getting all this energy. Two million. Which is what you know, energy so you need to give it back somehow. Right. Fair enough. Um, okay. So public transit in Atlanta. Are there any? Are there any things that maybe? Because you were saying that there's a lot of things that. Uh, that are gay and that they don't tend to deal with, but that's not you. Are there things that you hear other people deal with that strike you as something to focus on? You know, I don't know anymore. I think maybe, you know, 10 years ago, yeah, you've heard it more, maybe even five years ago, but I don't really think I, you know, like, what I meant before when I said that I hear, heard some things from friends, it's like a situation, like somebody calling them a fag or whatever down the street. Like, it happens less now than it did before, but... As far as, like, jobs and friends that have been fired from work, like, I don't know. I don't... Off the top of my head, I'm, like, running quickly through my list of people that I'm friends with um, and people that I know and acquaintances, and, like, I haven't heard any of those stories lately. So... Because, you know, people used to... Um, you know, they would say, like, well, you know, I live in Lawrenceville, and you can't really be either, and, like, my boss found out and I got fired. Right, right. But I don't think I hear that really anymore. I do read in the papers... Um, or not in the papers, physical papers, online papers. Yeah. Um, this really interesting debate regarding, and I've seen it multiple times actually for different people, of like the Catholic Church firing someone for being gay once they find out mm-hmm. or once they've gotten married. But I have to say, I tend to agree with the Catholic Church on that position because I think that as an out gay person, it doesn't make sense that you're working for an organization that doesn't like you. And going into it, when you're hired, you know that this organization that you're working for, very powerful, by the way, the most powerful company in the world, right? Oh. Um, they don't they don't agree with your lifestyle and preach against you often. So I'm not really sure why you'd be surprised that you were fired from somewhere that didn't agree with your lifestyle to begin with, nor do I understand why you'd be taking money from an organization that doesn't like you anyway. I mean, that's fair, but... At some point, is there that gray area between, yes, logically that makes sense, why would you even do it in the first place? But then it's still from the objective perspective. I don't think so, because you often hear people arguing about the, the, you know, the separation of church and state, and I think that it's unfair for anyone to use it for your advantage and then not use it the other way around once you're at your disadvantage. So you can't say to me that you're, that you expect that the church not get involved politically or give money to whomever or whatever the situation is with the president or the governor, or whatever it is, and then turn around and say, but you're annoyed that the church fired you for being gay. Like, you can't play both sides of the card. You know what I mean? Okay. So you either agree with the separation or you don't agree. And if you don't agree with it and you think that it needs to be maneuvered differently or resolved in some capacity, then I can hear you saying that you're annoyed that it happened. But I just have an issue with people using it to the playing both sides, you know what I mean? Right, just to what, what is most Whatever. convenient to you. Right. Okay. Thanks right. Good. Any other issues you want to cover? Mm. I don't know. Do you want a chocolate for Donald? Do you want one? Oh, yes. <laughs> um, you can pick them up. I want to bring them Oh, is it cold in there? That's why they're by the heater. Oh, thank you. I'm pick them up. Pick them up. Did you wash your hands? Well, I, I, I'm still up to the right. I'm like trumpeting. Oh no. On the camera. Um. No. Okay. So let's take a look at the future. So this is one of my favorite parts because it's where I think that uh, as just the people that talk to each other and live with each other, maybe it'd be helpful if we all kind of knew where we wanted to go. So I like to think about it. So let's start with what do you think the next five years are going to look like, just in general? Um, for the world? Okay. It can be <laughs> the world, our city, but, like, together. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think in the next five years, there's going to be a really huge um, implementation of equal rights across the board for um, almost every kind of human being. Um, you know, you talk about the fact that the civil rights happened, and there's obviously still the black and white issue in many cities and states happening, but... but Overall, it's gotten better, and I think it will get better and better and better and better. Um, I mean, before that was women's rights, right? Like, they didn't have them, and now they do, they can vote. Like, there's still um, 
women are still underpaid and they're still undervalued in the workspace, but it's getting better. Mm -hmm. More women are, are getting into powerful positions and it's showing men that um, they can do the same work and better, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I think for five years down the road, I'd like to think that every state will have passed, you know, gay marriage, making it legalized in, in every state or whatever. I think the next issue that we're going to tackle as um, a nation is um, the overweight issue because I think that we, our media sources and our media outlets and um, us as individuals, we really hyper-focus on people that are overweight. And I think that's going to be the next targeted group that is going to, you're going to see like an uprise movement from this group that's that's like, stop, stop treating us this way, stop looking at it this way, stop um, making jokes about it. And like, I will rewind and say that I'm not someone who gets offended very often. I'm not one of those like radical thinking, like everything offends me in the world. Um, but at the same time, like we really do target overweight people in so many different capacities and we hold people in general such a high standard. So I just feel that's going to be the next group that really is going to push in. I don't know how, it, I guess it won't be really political but I think it'll be more of like a movement for the country to really like accept people's body types for what they are. So you, do you think it'd be more that like acknowledging that there's different body types and that's okay, or or necessarily more specifically on overweight? Well, than, like fat shaming. I don't really know. I mean, I, again, like I know that I make a statement that I have to rewind to connect it to other thoughts because all my things have thoughts that connect them. But like our food is the worst, right? Mm -hmm. So if you think about it people are overweight in our country because our food right, right. is the worst and and um, we live in cities that aren't walkable cities and everyone's driving and the more money that you have the more standard that you're at with your life so the more luxury living that you have the less exercise and movement and the food. you know what I mean it's like the cycle but I think that I think that it'll just be a movement to acknowledge the fact that body types are what they are and like if I choose to work out and have a perfect body, then that's what I choose. But also, if I choose not to, then it doesn't matter and stop making that thing. You know? Definitely. Okay. Um, so let's, let's look at... So, so that's what you think will happen, right? That's what I think will happen, yeah. But what, and I think, well, I think Hillary Clinton will be our next president. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so that's the, that's next, the next five years. Yeah. Yeah, okay. That's right. So that's the next five years, what you think will happen. Now, what do you want to see happen? Like, are there any things you think we're not focusing on that we really should? Um, no, all of that. I would want I would want to see all of that. Um, I, would, I would really love to see true equal rights for every human being across the board. And I would love to see more um, acknowledgement and um, implementing of education in other cultures. Uh, into every possible scenario and education system from like elementary school through college to in the work in the workspace like I would I would love if Americans were more educated on the way that the whole world works instead of just our country because I think uh, a lot of our out media outlets um, hyper focus on what's happening in our area mm -hmm. and I don't think that most Americans have a clue about the way that the world works the way that the world views us and the way that they culturally um, um, lead their own lives and how successful they are at doing what they do. You know, like uh, Norway and Sweden and all of that, like, have Why are they the happy wonderful, happy, school happy awesome. schools are great, it's paid for, they have um, socialized medicine, they have, uh, I, I think, I think it's, I think it's Norway, I'm not sure, we have to look it up, actually pays couples to have children because what's happening is that um, they're so educated that they're realizing that the more children they have the more that it right um and so now they're, they're they've implemented laws where it's like you know you get like a fifty thousand dollar stipend from the city when you because they want to keep their population growing it's something like a hundred thousand we have to look it up there's a thing we'll look it up um but they're like they're wanting their country to still remain populated and have growth and expansion and they know that people aren't having three, four, five, six, seven kids anymore but they still want them to have one or two because their population is deep. So it's like the opposite problem that we have. They're so overly educated that they're looking at it and they're saying I don't want to have five kids because that doesn't really make sense. And here we are in our country having like 20 <laughs> Octomom. Octomom. Eight, yeah. you know. Um, so yeah, no, I just think like, and not that I'm saying that I think that we should change what we do drastically or make our decisions based on that 
happening here, but I think the more we know about the way that the world works, yeah. the more that we'll look at things in a different way and say, that's so smart that they do that, why don't we do that? And then I think it'll make us question who's in power and then hopefully it'll that change. For sure. Okay. I like education. It. Education. Let's raise the education standard. Oh, please. Let's have, let's have a class implemented in high school or, and or college that's a logic class. Does anyone teach that? A common sense logic. class? Uh, like, like, like a pure and simple scenario, situations, and make someone answer in a logical way. Did they have that? Is that... That's kind of like... Could they, could they play, maybe chess? <laughs> <laughs> chess athletes? Like, I don't know. Maybe. I want to see a logic class. Okay. And I want it to be mandatory for everyone to take it. I'm down. I like it. Alright, let's, let's uh, finish this up with something like... Where is Bar Barry Brandon going in the next five years? Well, hopefully, Sing for Your Life will be televised at that point. Um, hopefully, we will have connected with a record label and a management company, so the artists that are being developed um, are on the show, and they're leaving better artists than they were when they entered, and sifting out. Hopefully, um, J.L. Rodriguez, my best friend, will be writing music for those artists, and we'll have one at Grammy or two. That'd be great. Um, and uh, hopefully, I'll have my talk show in five years, right? Five years. That's good. Yeah, that's good. I'll have it in three. <laughs> a talk show and a show on TV. Well, you should you should just at a bigger it. apartment. Ah, uh, and probably eight pugs. Eight pugs. You gotta yeah. have eight. Okay, it's even. Octo. <laughs> yeah, octo. Yeah. Um, well, maybe you should do your your talk show on Patreon. A lot of people can directly fund you. You know how that works. Yet? No. So Patreon is a website for creators of any kind. Oh, come here, come here, come here, come here. Hold on, she's trying to get some babies. Oh, they're all in there. Hello. <laughs> so, so Patreon is just a website for creators to get recurring uh, funds from people that want to support them. Patreon. So, yeah. So, was that my phone? I'm gonna text myself because I just um oh I just actually um on my on my own website uh, did like a, a donation page where people can donate for Sing For Your Life and or Songs of Joe on the record. Um, but maybe this one makes more sense. Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Okay. Yeah, so it's a way for creators, whether it's music, podcast, videos, just artwork, whatever. It's a way for people that like you to be like, oh, I'll be a patron of this, donate a dollar a month, whatever. And you can offer rewards, have direct communication with your fans, cool. give them like advanced, like free downloads or whatever. Yeah. Really great way. Some people are making legit money. Great. So, I'm gonna look I'm gonna look into it and um do a thing. Awesome. This is Miss Piggy. Please be more. She just have baby. <laughs> Hi pretty girl. She looks like E. T. I know. She's I not the prettiest thing in the world, but you know, we love her just the same. Some people think she's a pretty scene in the world. I say, I'm not. She's either a praying mantis, ET, or there's a third option. Oh, what is it? Uh, an Ewok. Ewok. Okay. And when she's in a way, she's an Ewok. But I, I say, it. but I say, um, ET. Ewok. Ewok. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Little thing. Uh. Okay. Well. Uh. Thank you, Barry Brandon. Thank you. Is there anything you'd like to say to any listeners? Plug any of your things? Um, yeah, check out uh, sandforyourlifeatl.com. For, uh, we're in season three. We just um, closed out our video submission portion, so now we're going to move on in December for the live auditions. And then we will start our official season in January, so follow along, come to the show. And um, check out houseofabrandon.com. It's H A O H A U S. House. Oh, oh, um, for different projects that we're working on, you can keep up with uh, the Songs of Jail record and any projects that any of our creative group is working on next. You can find out what's up with Jean Kelly. We were, yeah, we were yeah. watching with The Voice. Yes, She's a yes. good friend of ours. She was the host of Sing for Life last year. So um, find out about her through through wherever. Her Find out through her website as well, but you know we always post about her. And, um, and Michael Robinson's doing some stuff, and so is Josette. So yeah. Check out our little artist creative team and see what we're up to. Awesome. I'll put all that in the description or in the video. Uh, cool. Whichever format makes sense. Um, any last thoughts? Uh, last thoughts are uh, my extreme apologies for you coming to my apartment when there are six <laughs> pugs, my sister, my dad, my nephew, and many interruptions by the dogs freaking out about people opening and closing doors. So <laughs> thanks for dealing with and rolling with all the punches. Not a problem. Thanks, Mary. Thanks. Thanks. 
All right, everybody. Uh, thanks for listening. It's another podcast, and we'll be back next time. I'll see you next time.